name of the show is The Way to Go. My name is Alan Bendich. I'm going to be your host. And tonight we have part two of the Frank Sinclair story. Frank, hey. welcome to the show. Howdy. So Frank, uh, I'm so happy that, you know, coincidentally you were in town. I mean, I knew you were coming around and I, I knew that I wasn't sure of the week and the week that you were coming down. I knew we wanted to talk about what we discussed in the last episode, which was talking about working, getting a little bit further with uh, The Laundry Man, which is the movie that you're the screenwriter and co-executive producer of. And um, this is, I'm looking at this as a true partnership between two p people who are like, who have been friends for a gazillion years and um, something that we always kind of dreamed of in a way, even though it wasn't this project, it's something that keeps us together. Okay. Yeah, I remember at one point uh, we, we made a promise to each other. Remember that? I remember, that? I do. Uh, especially just before you left for Hollywood. Right. I says, you know, if you make it, man, you know, see mm -hmm. if you can find a way to pull me in. <laughs> if I make it in professional music and right. everything else, I'll pull your ass in. You right. know, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. You know, right. and, but uh, you know, I'm I'm actually there's another person who's my editor. I'll probably pull him into our little cadre also, and. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a really good potential of making something happen with, between the, you know, a combination of short films, but this is a feature film that we were actually, mm -hmm. uh, that you created. Correct. I mean... Uh, 98 minutes. Wow, 98 minutes is perfect, actually. Yeah. And uh, the, the one thing is that LM's, uh, yeah, I'll never forget that I came up with the idea, and then we spoke about it, and then I went to LMC TV, and they said, sure, you know, like, not, you know, it's, it might be even a first. You know that this and, but I, you know, I, I look at like LMC TV as as something that is like an unbelievable benefit for people who live in this area that people just don't take advantage of. I mean, could you imagine back in the day when we lived in the Bronx, if we had opportunity to have our own television show? Yeah, I mean, access to professional equipment and everything like uh, and and, here. and unbelievable volunteers. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, and like talented. Tom, Brian, and Matt. Yeah. And Dina, well, she's she's not the volunteer, but she's yeah. unbelievable. But the talent, man, it's phenomenal. It's, I've, it's seen, so I've good. seen your stuff, you know. And, uh, but it's it's fun. Yeah, you know, at least well, for this kind of show, it's more of just a conversation between two people, mm -hmm. and we have so much. To t I mean, we've we've done so much together in terms of our life, and this is just a, another chapter that we're working on. I think this is going to be really good, and um, I can't wait till I could already see that once we do it. I could see us submitting to film festivals and stuff like that. And maybe if, you know, that's what I'm looking forward Might to. Might get a shot, you know. Yeah. You just never know. It's, it's what, what it is, if nothing else. I promised myself that it would be honest. Right. I would take myself back because I did grow up on the cusp of Harlem. That's right. So I got to know the culture real well. I hung out in Harlem. I hung out with Harlem dudes. And some of them were real bad boys. Right. And a lot of them were pretty good guys, too. So I ch chose to hang out mostly with the good guys, but I had a passing acquaintance with the bad guys. So it lent itself to uh, a more realistic portrayal of some of the characters that I wrote about. Now, all I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to get permits to, to shoot this stuff, because mm -hmm. I wanted to, I want, you know, I want Harlem Hospital to, I want to get permission to shoot Harlem Hospital, yeah. at least the exterior. Exterior shots. And uh, I want to make sure that, you know, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard which, uh, what was it? it used to be called a different, but that's where he was shot. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, that I, and I want to do everything above board. I'm not going to shoot it guerrilla style, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think that uh, no one, I, because of your closeness to my father and closeness to me and, and my family, I don't think anyone could have written it more accurately or, or gotten the, the tenor as, as right as, as you did. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing it. It's just, cool. I gotta figure out how to do it. It's like, it's gonna be a rough one. And to believe it all started in Co-op City, you know what I mean? <laughs> when we first met each other 44 years ago. To me, that's sure. an amazing, uh, it's amazing how people just even, how people bump into each other and then you wind up being friends for 44 Paths years. Across here. And you, you know, you, you often hear it said by uh, various people that there are no chance meetings, you know, and I really subscribe to that uh, belief. You know, not, not as metaphysically as many, but uh, I just know that there's a reason that uh, people are put together, you know. I, I also have the converse of that, which is, I mean, how many times have we crossed paths with people that we could have, should have, would have, might have been right. doing great things with? But I'm so happy that we were able to cross paths, That's certainly. It. Well, the, it's, it's always nice to know that there's someone in the world 
that you could call. I mean, because a lot of people throw around the word friend a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, we're friends, you know, Facebook friends, we're this kind of, whatever, you know, like my pal, you know, a good guy. <laughs> but, you know, it's, the, it's really the friends that, yeah. that, you know, stand the test of time yeah. that really, you know, help define you. You know, I mean, that, I, I'll put it like Max, my father, okay? I mean, he was friends with his, my mother, you know what I mean? And I'm happy that he was strong enough to be able to, you know, to survive my mother's passing. But sometimes, you know, I mean, and he's a, he's a person that has a lot of friends, you know, but I think friendship is like, uh, it's such a dear thing that if you lose, if you lose a friend, I know you lost a, a very close friend. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it really gives you, it shakes, you know, who you are, right? For sure, and it also kind of reminds you of your own mortality sometimes, right. you know. Although I don't have any particular fears along those lines, but I mean, I can understand how, uh, you know, it just reminds you to maybe, if nothing else, be thankful for what you do have, you know. And, well, I know yeah. one of your best friends in the world mm. was, uh, was Perry Damone, right? I right. Mean, uh, and you recently lost him, and uh, yeah, he, he was an amazing person. I mean, what he did for children, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it, that's his legacy, right? And, and it continues that's to this day. Perry yeah. Damone established a, uh, a program called the Kid Star Radio Network back in Phoenix in 1988. And who is Perry Damone? Perry Damone is the son of a legendary singer, Vic Damone, right. who's also a very close friend, and uh, uh, Italian actress, uh, uh, Pierre Angeli. And uh, so, you know, to me that was such a cool thing. And Perry always went out of his way not to make that a part of anything when he dealt with people. I mean, he was a big, I mean. He was the, a big the, name in his own right. Yeah. And, but also, I mean, <laughs> what happened between him and his father and mother, I mean, that made all the tabloids oh, for, yeah. forever. I mean, I mean, if you Google that, I mean, it was an unbelievable exactly. situation that you had for this poor little boy stuck in the middle between these two people. A, a custody battle, uh, I mean, unbelievable proportions. I mean, we're talking about at a time when parental rights were right. strictly mom, right. you know. So Pierre decided to take pit little Perry and whoosh off to back to Rome. And of course, Vic is like, excuse me, you know, so uh, yeah, it became, like you said, it, I didn't realize the extent of it until after I got to know Perry for a while. And he intimated certain things. And uh, at one point, when he was about 12 or so, how these uh, big burly guys came and just said, you're coming with us. And his dad was there, you know. He says, and you know, you can kind of tell, you know, I mean, these, these weren't just your neighborhood, uh, you know, friendly uh, dairymen, you know, I mean. <laughs> He, uh, you know, and off he went back on a private jet back to the States, you know, and, uh, and then the battle really intensified. And, but, uh, you know, fast forward to Perry as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, in, in Hollywood actually with his dad. And uh, here's a kid who pretty much only knew Italian, so now he's got to assimilate. Oh, did he have an accent? He, he did when he first started, when oh, he came back as a that. kid. Yeah, yeah, because he, he was taken at a young age. So he pretty much learned Italian, you know, spoke Italian like that's it. So he said that the way that he learned English was to listen to the radio. And of course, AM radio being the top medium of the day. Uh, people like Charlie Tuna, who's still around. In oh, fact, we're friends. I mean, uh, Charlie and myself and, and other guys. Because uh, you've done radio as well. Yeah. Oh, well, that, yeah, that, I'll get into that in just a little bit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, because, uh, you know, Perry's the one actually who introduced, introduced me to radio. But uh, okay. he, he's listening to, uh, you know, Charlie Tuna doing his thing. And back in the day of the boss jocks, hey, this is your cousin Brucey. <laughs> you know, people like that. You know, they're, they're you know. And, and Charlie was to say, everybody's doing their thing. And he's like, wow, this is cool. I like this. And he's just listening and learning and learning and learning. And ever since he was a kid, that's, that's how he did it. He'd get his little tape recorder, kind of like what I ended up doing ultimately, right. and having little shows and interviewing his dad and uh, you know playing stuff back. And wow. uh, so he, he got into radio from a young age. So now Perry grows up and becomes a broadcaster here in Phoenix. You know, uh, and uh, in the midst of that, he always had a love and a memory of how he got into broadcasting and how he got to loving it, rather, and uh, that is to go through the kids. So uh, he uh, established the uh, Kid Star Radio Network at the Thomas J. Pappas School in Phoenix at the time, which was a, actually a school for homeless kids. Wow. Yeah. I mean, talk about a novel concept, you know. 
And here he takes kids who are going to be troublesome by the nature of their existence. Right. And he had his yeah. own issue of being not homeless, but he was stuck. So I, I think that that, yeah. ties, that ties it a little bit. Exactly. I mean, he was like iffy. I mean, I'm here, I'm there. What's I mean, what, I'm what, sorry what, to interrupt. No, not at all. So he, uh, so he started there. He, and what he did was he got um, an actual professional uh, miniature low-power radio station and installed it in the Thomas J. Pappas School. And uh, actually, the kids were able to uh, produce and direct and uh, and do the whole the whole thing. I mean, a whole radio show conducted by kids for kids. When did he start that? 1988. Did he have? Uh, did any of them go on to professional radio? Or there's did been this... a number who have, and of course, I, I can't. Uh, um, Get the names. Oh, off it's okay. Of my head. But the but kids have done it. But yeah, well, kids have definitely gone into professional broadcasting, both on radio and television, and in the uh, written media. Too. But I would also think, you know, that they didn't necessarily have to do that to have their lives improved mm -hmm. by what he did. He gave them uh, like a voice. He gave them a meaning to life. He gave yeah, them yeah. the strength to mm -hmm. say, "I could do this. Maybe I could do something else." You know, Correct. because success breeds success. So exactly. he was a good man. Yeah, confidence. That that's was the name of the game. That's what I meant he, to say. He taught these kids confidence, kids who got into nothing but trouble. Right. But the deal was, to get in the program, you have to have good grades, you have to be uh, punctual, right. you have to do your assignments on time, and, uh, you know, you got to behave, basically. you got you got to toe the line. Right. And uh, as a result, the results that he got with the Kids Start program at that school were such that the brass at the school were just amazed at the change in the kids that were in the program. By and large, I think uh, I say nine out of ten of the kids that, that participated did, turned the grades around from D's and F's into uh, B's and sometimes A's and sometimes C's, but certainly in the right direction. That's fantastic. So reading levels went up, uh, math levels went up. I mean, uh, discipline problems went down. So, I mean, yeah, it was a good thing. They liked it. So as a result, other schools in Phoenix uh, asked if they could be part of the program. And Perry, at that point, you know, it was just like um, free flow. You know, it's like, hey, somebody else likes this. Sure, I'll do it. And before you know it, within five years, the Kid Star Radio program had 27 schools wow. in the greater Phoenix area. So, And the program continues to this day where uh, we have uh, schools. I've actually been appointed to the board recently by the uh, board of directors, which is a great Congratulations. Honor, you know. Thank you. If anyone, Thank but you. I would say this, if anyone deserves to be appointed to the board and be the chairman of the board is you. I yeah. mean, no one had a better friend to Perry than you, and that's the truth. I mean, you were with him till the end. Yeah, and, and I'll get into that also. Um, you know, it, it, all I could say is that I'm happy that the legacy continues. Uh, funding looks like it's uh, becoming a reality. In fact, I'm flying out to London oh, that's great. Uh, coming up in the fall. Of course, it's going to be a bittersweet uh, right. thing because of uh, Perry's passing in December to take his remains to oh. inter with his mom, Pierre oh, Angeli, in, oh. uh, in France, in Paris. But also to see family in, in Rome, which was great to see last time, you know. And also to shoot back to London and uh, and get to see about there are ten schools that might be a pilot project oh, that's great. for the Kid Star program in UK. What so, a legacy! Yeah. So I mean, and it continues. There's other uh, other great things in the works. I mean, the Steve Harvey show is on the horizon. Uh, they were actually going to interview Perry, but then he just went uh, downhill so quick. That was so sad. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. and I know how close you two were. I mean, it's, it, it, but. His legacy continues. Yes. So I mean, it, it, it's amazing. Like some people pass and they don't even make a ripple. Correct. And some people make have changed lives. And well, it wasn't are, easy for yeah. Perry, right? I no. mean, he had a rough life. And you know what? He he's not one of these kids. Even though his folks were, you know, they pretty pretty accomplished. Uh, Very accomplished. Or, you know, uh, right. in their own right, and and pretty well to do. He never ever sponged off dad or anybody else. He from when he was eighteen. He insisted on making his own way. So how did you meet him? Actually, I met him in Phoenix at a um, DJ gig that he was doing at a popular hotel, the uh, Fountain Suites Hotel. And uh, it was just kind of like a, like a nice convention type hotel, real fancy, but not, uh, not, a, hundred, not a four diamond resort, but right. uh, maybe like a three diamond. It's really nice. And he was uh, doing a DJ gig along with a guy called Ron Gerson who uh, they turned out to be lifelong friends as well, and we all became lifelong friends in the end. 
Ron Gerson was the director of entertainment at the Fountain Suites at the time. He hired Perry on. And then they both ultimately went on to work at a local FM station in Phoenix called uh, KEZ 99.9 FM. So from there, uh, I, I had met Perry in the midst of all this while he was still at the Fountain Suites Hotel one day when I was just moving into Arizona and uh, in 88. And I said, hey, Perry Damone. Are you Perry Rocco Luigi Damone? Knowing his full name, right. you know, because I was a great fan of the family, you know, his right. dad and his mom. He says, yeah. And, of course, me still looking like a cop like I did back then, <laughs> you know. Like yeah. Because you are an ex-NYPD. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, well, yeah, thank you. I don't say that too. Oh, much. I'm sorry. <laughs> I say that somewhat sheepishly anymore, the way things are going. You right. know, of course, I never shot anybody. Please. Right. But... Um, he, uh, you know, he's, he's, yeah, he was a little leery. I says, no, 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 I'm a fan of, of your dad's, man, Don't, not to worry. I'm not a cop or anything, and I, I could care less, you know. Yeah. I'm not going to come after you, man. Yeah. I just dig your style. I like your DJ work. And, and we got to talking. And from there, uh, it, it took off. It blossomed and, and whatnot. He realized that I'm not a hanger on. I'm not a moocher. Right. Uh, you know, uh, which is a sad thing because people assume because he's Perry DeMont, son of Vic and right. you know, Pierre, that, uh, you know, he'll pick up the tab if you go out with him, you know, stuff like that. And I, I, would, uh, I would really get upset by that. That right. would never happen with me, right. you know. So he, he liked me because, yeah, I don't mooch, man. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm your pal. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to mooch off you. So that blossomed into uh, uh, pretty much a, a lifelong friendship. But along the way, while he was at KEZ, I was going through uh, a period of uh, marital change, let's say, you know. And uh, it wasn't uh, until several years later that I really needed help getting a gig. I mean, I just, I had, uh, my insurance agency went to, uh, you know, in the midst of the uh, marital changes. And I thought, okay, I got to do something with my life, you know. So I started doing a couple of things here and there. I always maintained my mail order operation, which is what kind of helped keep things, you know, stable to some extent. And, of course, um, I met a, a, a new gal who, in the midst of all that, was turned out to be the love of my life and, you know, um, helped really stabilize things. But uh, he, uh, he actually got me a job at uh, KEZ. Wow. I was a, a producer and, uh, and a, a technical director, which is nice. I mean, it's a fancy term for a board op. Right. And uh, and a uh, and a part time producer, but right. still it was great. It was a thrill because that I probably was like the, lo the the most exciting thing that's. Uh, I mean, yeah. I know because of your love for t technology and sure, all this. You stuff. know, I've always loved all yeah. that stuff. So here I am running a huge board, you know, right. which is nothing but a few pots and everything, but it looks really impressive. And I'm doing remotes with Perry and right. uh, and whatnot, and getting signals off the microwave, and and just learning all kinds of new technology, which. Uh, you know, for a guy who only knew how to run a uh, a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, four-track uh, that was fun back tape then. recorder, I yeah. mean, this was a, a pleasant change, let's say. But uh, he also taught me the fine points of the radio clock, which is what they do at the Kid Star program. So he basically, I became the oldest Kid Star. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> which uh, he says, mm -hmm. hey, listen, it's not as tough as it seems, you know. I mean, relax, relax. Look, this channel here is me. Right. This channel there is Ron. Right. That channel over there is the music. That channel there are the spots. Right. So just, you know, you'll get it. You'll get it. Trust me. And before you know it, you know, he was so patient. Right. And, uh, you know, so I'd, I'd, I ended up uh, running his his uh, remotes and everything else. And that that's uh, how it all happened. So right? was was Perry married? Uh, see, I'm not familiar with uh, his, his yeah. situation. Yeah, Perry um, got married right around the time that I met Kathy uh, about... Six months later, he ends up getting married. And Kathy's your wife, right? Yes. Just yes. for the audience. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the love of my life. Right. Uh, actually, Nancy, I met Nancy before Perry did. And Nancy is, was Perry's was uh, his, wife? Was his wife, yes. Uh, okay. And he is uh, now widow. Um, she worked at the post office across the street and down the block from where I had my insurance office in Scottsdale. And I would take all my weekly mailings, I did two or three weekly mailings to all the people in that area, right. you know, looking for business, and uh, and it was her that I always tried to get to the window to see, because she was quite a lovely gal, you know, yeah. quite nice indeed. So anyway, she was also going through a marital uh, change at the time, mm -hmm. and, but we both knew better than to try anything. We just stayed really good friends, and it was funny how paths cross again, you know, 
Perry used to do, uh, after he did his kit start thing, he'd go to this little uh, hole in the wall in Phoenix. And uh, it turns out that he, this one night he goes there and there's this gal singing a song from Foreigner, I Want to Know What Love Is, oh. right? <laughs> but in the midst of singing the song, he sees tears streaming down her eyes. She's sad because, I mean, she's breaking up with her old man, right. you know. And uh, so he looks at her and it's like, wow. He saw the power, you know, this guy, she can sing, man, and uh -huh. she can. She's really, really talented. So he ended up uh, asking her if she'd like a drink and everything else. But the way it works out, I mean, here's a gal that I knew right. and a guy who I knew, right. none of which knew each other beforehand. So I'll talk about the way paths cross. And uh, they, they hit it off, and ultimately they married. So uh, how, uh, so how long ago was that that, that they got married? It was in uh, 1992. So they were married uh, until 2014? Yes. Wow, so that's a long marriage. It is. And it, did they have any kids? No, no okay. kids, no kids. Evidently, I think uh, they probably wanted to spare the earth any more trouble, <laughs> yeah, is yeah. the way he put it to me, because <laughs> he had a heck of a sense of humor. Right. You know? So, uh, yeah, so, they decided to And you were close to them, from, were you at the ma a wedding? I actually uh, was out of town at the time of their wedding, so okay. I couldn't make it, so, but, uh, it did turn around that a couple of years later in 94 when Kathy and I got married, right. that Perry was the best man in my wedding. So, so. It, it, we, we caught up that way and Nancy actually sang the, uh, the songs, you know, at the third. So you guys were very wedding. close for 20, 22 years? How long? More than 1992? That, 88 to... Oh, 88. Yeah, to 14. Wow, so even longer. Yeah, wow. yeah it's quite a while. <laughs> so when... So Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, when did he start getting, he got sick? Yeah, Perry Damone got sick, and it was January 2012. Right. Um, he just was not feeling right. Um, he had a weird rash. And actually, <laughs> rewind before that. Yeah. Since July of uh, 11, he had had this weird rash, and it's a uh, you know, really purpley, weird looking thing. And, and all the skin doctors, eh, try this cream, try that cream, try this, you know. Nobody knew what it was. Anyway, so after a while, he's feeling weird too. He just wasn't feeling right. So he went to uh, the the hospital in Scottsdale, and uh, they took some blood and everything else. And it turns out this is, hey, listen, uh, we need to talk to you. And that's when they laid it on him that he's got uh, uh, lymphoma. And uh, so therefore, he was actually admitted that night, and he was in total shock. What stage was he at? He, at that point, it was probably stage two already. Oh, wow. Yeah, because he had waited so long because right. of the rash and what is this and what is that. And, and he got misdiagnosed right. and blah, blah, so blah, blah. it's eating away at him. Right. So uh, what, what happens is he gives me a call. I'm the first person, not even his wife. Oh, my God. I'm the first person he called. So I go flying to the hospital, you know. And it just so happens that I work at that hospital. So <laughs> I had, although I had gotten home at that point, so I flew back to the hospital. I mean, just as soon as I could, and I think 15 minutes flat, I covered 16 miles, you wow. know, so. <laughs> and uh, just to be there with him, and it, it was tough. I mean, he didn't know what to do, you know, and uh, what to say, and I says, hey, listen, let's work this thing one step at a time. You know, I'm gonna be here with you no matter what. I know, and so, you and you yeah. were there. You, No one, again, once again in your life, no one was a better friend than you. I mean, uh, you were there for every moment. You documented him, you, you were there holding his hand, you were there I mean, continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. I, uh, you know, I, it, it, it was a, let's put it this way, it was a journey. Right. It was a journey. And, uh, but he was prepared to fight. And right. uh, he thought, you know, we're going to lick this. And that was the attitude. And that's the best attitude to go into this thing with. Right. From, I had spoken to the manager of the uh, oncology unit, who I know very well. Right. And uh, he says, yeah, that's the best thing, man. Try to keep it as positive as you can, you know. And then, of course, he goes to the uh, the cancer center at this uh, medical center and uh, gets really deep down test and, uh, you know, all the new genetic testing. In fact, they were, uh, that place was at the forefront of the Human Genome Project. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, that whole crew, so I know those guys too, all those researchers, you know how much I love science. And, Absolutely. Uh, I almost kind of feel bad that I, I know you should have been a doctor we know we know <laughs> I, 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 know. I could have been uh, maybe helpful in this case but worked my uncle anyway <laughs> <you? laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah, but um, uh, the bad news came and that was that this was a type of lymphoma that these guys were just perplexed they have never seen anything like it it's insidious it's invasive 
and uh, I mean, they're at their wit's end already, and this right. is early on in the treatment. You know, they gave them uh, the typical CHOPS protocol, which is uh, what they hit uh, these strong ones with, and I forgot what all the acronyms right. are, but uh, suffice it to say, it's pretty ugly chemo. And uh, I mean, it, it beat them up pretty bad. I, uh, only because yeah. I, I, I'd like to go along with it. I mean, how long, um, so did, at any point did it, St oh, was it, uh, what is it, uh, what's the word when it stops? Uh, remission. Right, did he go through a remission? He did, he did go through a remission at one point after seven, about seven months of uh, solid therapy where he got. So how did he feel during the time during the remission? Oh, I mean, it was all the classic, I mean, the metallic taste, the, 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 the nodules on the tongue. He needed the magic mouthwash to make uh, his tongue just get back to normal. It would swell, it would get ugly, and he couldn't taste right. He felt like crap, the hair yeah. fell off, you know, yeah. all the classic stuff from uh, heavy chemo. So, but uh, luckily, you know, I was able to be there with him because of the fact that I worked there. Right. So, so, and so it went on. Uh, so I know that by the time you, I, I know that it continued. Mm -hmm. You decided at one point that you wanted to take a trip to Europe. Yes. At that point, did you know that the time was drawing near? Well, actually, no, because he had, this is in uh, July of 2013, the following right. year. Um, he was declared to be in remission. Oh, okay. So that's when we final, finalized the trip for September right. of 2013. So here we are in the midst of our trip. We fly into um, London and we hang out with Jeffrey, our, our contact out there, who's now going to be part of the Kitstar program right. and uh, helping it to flourish out there. Uh, and then we went to um, Rome. You know, Kathy and I actually snuck from UK to Paris for one day for five hours, <laughs> where we had our friend Alain from right. St. Dennis, just north of Paris, showed us around. Paris in five hours, but that's another chapter. So we all ran to uh, uh, Rome, right. and uh, that's when I noticed, wait a minute, he's in remission, but and now we're at the Colosseum, and he's walking kind of weird. I said, Perry, are you all right? He says, man, it's like I'm hurting all over again, man, and right where it was hurting so before, it's, beginning to it's kick back. In. This thing was so darn insidious. What it was is that it considered the chemo like fertilizer, so is what the doc said. So when he, the trip was unbelievable, I saw the pictures. It was it probably real. It was wonderful that you were able to share it with. Oh, twenty eight hundred pictures I managed to shoot yeah. uh, out there, and uh, almost all of them were on Facebook, which was nice. I got a chance to see, you know, through through Facebook your journey. Mm -hmm. When he came back, um, was he ever the same again? He probably was not. Um, he had uh, peaks and valleys and, you know, false uh, positive, you know, mm -hmm. fa uh, false uh, right. good starts, and then he declined again. So how, w when did he pass away? He passed away December of 14 in the end. And here's what happened. Because of the positive thinking and having the strong support network, which, by the way, he got to um, establish a beautiful bond with his half-sister, Daniela. Right who was the, uh, the daughter of Vic Damone and another actress, uh, right. Rollins, Judith Rollins. Right. Um, so he managed to realize, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you find out by coincidence, he had an apartment in North Scottsdale. It turns out that his sister, who had moved to Scottsdale a year and a half earlier, lived less than a mile wow. from where he was. And it, it was a great way for them to uh, establish a tight well, bond. I feel, I feel so terrible about the loss, but I don't feel terrible about his life. No. I mean, this person has, has really, he's changed the life of many children. Indeed. And, and, and he adults. changed your life. Oh, truly. truly. And I think this is going to be, you know, we were wondering if we were going to have anything to talk about, but I think this is going to be one of the best episodes of The Way to Go. But unfortunately, there's only one thing left to say. Yeah. That's a wrap. Good night, folks. Wow.